Today is a pleasure and actually a, uh, a wonderful uh, grand round because we're hosting Dr. Steve Nissen. Uh, Steve does not need an introduction. I think he's one of the pioneers of cardiology. He's very well known throughout the world and he's a great friend at the same time. And our path has intersected for several years, be it at the ACC or uh, different conferences. We were talking uh, with Dr. Winters here, uh, three presidents in this room, and uh, reminiscing on the good days, and I think the great days are still ahead. Um, Steve, welcome to uh, our Cleveland Clinic Prime. And when I went to Grand Rounds up there, it was Houston Methodist Prime, because we share so many things, actually. Uh, we share our philosophy, our approach to medicine. Uh, we share many uh, faculty, uh, exchange program almost. We have, we have faculty as well as fellows, and um, we're both departments of cardiology uh, that uh, gives us resources, vision, strength, and I think that's what Steve has, has put together at Cleveland Clinic. He's been at Cleveland Clinic for 20, some 26 years or so and has been the chair of cardiology uh, since 2006. His interest uh, started, I think, from the early days of IVUS, and I think that was an entry into atherosclerosis and studies of atherosclerosis. So if you look at the big trials of IVUS and what happens to atherosclerosis, be it progression, and early on we were thinking about regression of atherosclerosis, um, Dr. Nissen certainly was the pioneer of that, and that spend into uh, other areas of atherosclerosis, and I think this is one of the uh, uh, topics of today, LP little a, and where does it fit into, you know, this uh, uh, markers, and what can we do about it? Um, Steve has uh, published quite a bit on that, but uh, it's his impact is not only in publishing science. Uh, if you see his impact also in uh, the public arena uh, on his thought and opinions, be it in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times and other things, uh, really he was instrumental beyond cardiovascular disease and atherosclerosis per se. So if you remember the days of Vioxx and who brought that to, uh, to the forefront and many other uh, pharmacological agents that had some effect on cardiovascular medicine. I think uh, Steve really was, was the pioneer to put that uh, uh, on the forefront. Now, not too many people can claim uh, the Time Magazine, uh, 100 most influential uh, people, uh, and it's not only about medicine, and that was in 2007. So Steve, that was, that was amazing. Uh, he was also a member of Cardiorenal Advisory Board and actually chair that Cardiovascular Ad Advisory Board and president of the ACC in 2006. Uh, we share a dear friendship over the years, and it really is a pleasure, uh, Steve, to have you here among us and tell us about you know, something new that we'd love to hear about, and you could tell how many people are interested in this topic. So it's great to have you in Houston. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you for such a gracious uh, introduction. And, you know, we do share a lot in common. Uh, I see people in the audience, some of the people we trained at the Cleveland Clinic have come here, and, uh, and we have people that have trained at, at your institution. There's a really uh, amazing kind of link between our two institutions. So I'm, I'm really uh, honored, and it's a privilege to come and, and chat with you about this topic, uh, which is emerging very rapidly. So I'm going to do a quick poll question. And I, you know, please, I want an honest answer to this question. So I want everybody who's ordered a lipoprotein little a in the last 30 days to raise their hand. OK. So it looks like there are three or four hands up, OK? That is going to change. It absolutely is going to change, and I'm going to tell you why it uh, will change and, sh and should. By the way, my disclosures are here. Uh, please note I do work with many pharmaceutical companies on clinical trials, but I don't take any money from them, honorary and no speaking fees, uh, so that I can be independent. So now the next question is, what is this, and why is it relevant to lipoprotein little a? Anybody want to answer that question? 
It's a Kringle. Peter, of course, knows. And a Kringle is a, uh, is a Danish pastry uh, that's kind of folded together like this. And I, I'll tell you in a few minutes why, it, why it's a relevant, uh, uh, relevant to understand Kringles. Kringle domains are these autonomous protein domains that fold into loops stabilized by three disulfide linkages. They're very involved in blood clotting and fibrinolytic uh, proteins. It comes, it's named after the Scandinavian pastry, which is really quite amazing. And it's found in plasminogen, uh, some growth factors, prothrombin, and apolipoprotein A, which is why it's so relevant here. This is just a little schematic of what a Kringle domain looks like. You see that in blue, those three disulfide bonds. And we're going to come back later on and talk about Kringle repeats uh, and how that's relevant to this whole topic of apolipoprotein A. I also want to acknowledge Sam Samikas, who's the pioneer in this field. Sam at UC San Diego uh, has been working on this for, for a decade or more. And he has, if you read nothing else, read his 2017 review in Jack. It is just brilliant. It's beautifully illustrated, and uh, I've uh, borrowed some of his uh, um, uh, schematics because they do help us to understand this topic. So this is now beginning to emerge in the public domain. Now, this is uh, from 2018. This article appeared in the New York Times. A heart risk factor even doctors know little about, and it shows Bob Harper the biggest loser guy, who it turns out had a MI at a relatively young age. And sure enough, his principal risk factor is lipoprotein little a. So this is a victim. And the victims are everywhere in your practice. But because most people are not ordering the test, most people don't know that these people are out there. And part of the reason I wanted to choose this topic is to increase awareness now that we are emerging, as I'm going to show you, with an opportunity to treat this disorder. So what is lipoprotein A? Well, it's an LDL-like particle. It's got ApoB covalently bonded to ApoA via disulfide bond. Many people think it evolved from the plasminogen gene, uh, which, as you know, is a proenzyme converted to the fibrinolytic enzyme uh, plasmin by activators such as TPA. It has some similarities to LDL, but it is more atherogenic, and it promotes both inflammation and thrombosis. And it comes in many iso isoforms, uh, at least 40, based upon Kringle 4 repeats, so a type of Kringle that I'll show you. Uh, and these are all contributing to atherogenic risk, but it is... It is uh, it is this duality of the particle that it's both atherogenic and thrombotic that makes it such a big problem. And here, here's the structure. Here's the key take home. You see at the top the structure of plasminogen, a bunch of Kringles and a protease domain. If you then look down below at, at the isoforms of LP little a, you see that there are, in this case, I've shown you two of them. There's one that has 40 Kringle 4 type 2 repeats and another that has four. Um, you'll notice that it has oxidated, oxidized phospholipid. It has ApoB, just as LDL does. And then it has this ApoA protein that's covalently bound to, the, uh, to that core. This, is, this duality plays a key role in its in why this is such a noxious particle. Now, first thing you need to know is that uh, there is an inverse relationship between how many Kringle 4s there are in ApoA and the level that you see in patients. So if you see on the right people that have 25 Kringle 4 repeats, so they have lots and lots of Kringle 4 repeats, and they have very low levels. On the left, you see people that have few Kringle 4 repeats, and their levels are very high. And so this, uh, this structure is responsible for determining genetically how high is lipoprotein A. So the question is, what's a risk risky level? 
a risky level, uh, you, you know, you, it's, it's obviously uh, uh, very dependent on the, on the level, what the level of risk is. But most people believe that the threshold for increased risk is in the range of about 50 milligrams per deciliter, which is about 100 nanomoles. Now, unfortunately, if you read the literature, it's easy to get confused because both sets of units are out there, and you can't easily convert from uh, uh, nanomoles to milligrams per deciliter. I'm giving you some rough conversions. So you can see 50, 60, 70, you know, uh, corresponds to those levels in, in nanomoles. That's the range at which you start to worry about patients. If you go and look at an, almost any population, although I'm going to show you there are some very significant ethnic and racial differences, you see that most of us in this room are going to be below 50. But about 20% of the population is above 50. And a smaller number, but a very important number, are above 100, 150. And I have patients, the highest one that I look after has an LP little a of 496, 500. And uh, if you go into your coronary care unit, and the reason I'm, uh, I'm urging you to begin thinking about this, and you get somebody who's 40 years old with an acute MI, you want to know what their lipoprotein little a is because those are the people that have 200, 300, 400 for lipoprotein little a, and we're going to need to know who they are very soon. There are very big racial and ethnic differences. So it turns out that whites, Chinese, Hispanics, uh, this is from Mesa, uh, have levels, mean levels that are normal. They're relatively low. African Americans, their levels are about uh, 35. Now, there are many people who believe that this gene, the LPA gene, originated in Africa. And you can actually look at migration patterns, and you can actually see how the genes spread from Africa to other populations. But it is important to recognize that in African Americans, that's where there's a disproportionately high level of lipoprotein little a. Here's the Dallas Heart Study, and I want you to see two things here about this. Note, the, these are, are, are obviously box and whisker plots where the, you see the 75 and 90% confidence limits. And you can see a couple of things. One is the lower 90% confidence limits are almost zero in whites and Hispanics, but not in blacks. You see the mean levels are higher, and then you also see that the 90% upper confidence levels are very high. I just want to point out here, in the African Americans, if you look at this level of 90% here, you're talking about one out of every 10 African Americans who you see as a patient has a lipoprotein little a level above 200 nanomoles. So that's a very important observation. Why is this so important? Why, why do cardiologists need to know more about lipoprotein little a? This, these are estimates. These are very good estimates, not done by me, but somebody else, suggesting that there are the top 20%, so above 50, is 1.4 billion people around the world. In the US alone, 64 million people have levels above 50. And if you go into your coronary care unit, if you go into your a secondary prevention population, it's a lot more than that. They're everywhere. These patients are absolutely everywhere. And you can see this. If you even just go to the, if you go to the top 5%, these are people with really high levels. There are 350 million people around the world with levels that high. Now there's a problem. And the problem you need to be aware of is somebody comes to see you. I get patients referred to me from all over with this problem. And they say, I had a lipoprotein little a, and it was X. And I immediately redraw it. And the reason I redraw it is this is a study showing that three different antibodies used for ELISA to measure it. And if you look at people that have a low number of Kringle repeats over here, those are the people with very high levels. Look at the difference between the antibodies. And you see, uh, depending on what antibody the laboratory uses, 
you can see an enormous difference in the levels. And so it's confusing. And so people will, if they go to different doctors and go at different laboratories, they're going to get different values. This is something we're going to have to solve. We're going to have to figure out how to measure this in a consistent way. And we're also going to have to figure out whether to measure milligrams per deciliter or nanomoles, because the world is not going to get there in terms of, of treating this risk factor if we don't have a constant way of, a consistent way of measuring it and a consistent units of measurement. Now I'm going to give you a key insight that almost never, nobody knows about, but you need to know about. Because lipoprotein A is an ApoB containing particle, it actually cross-reacts with LDL in most assays. The LDL obtained in a standard lipid panel, the lipid panel you order every day, is actually not measuring LDL alone, it's measuring LDL and lipoprotein little a. Why is that so relevant? Anybody here seen a patient who's alleged to have statin resistance? Well, let me tell you, if you take people who are, quote, statin resistant, you give them a statin and they don't go down the way you thought they would, measure their LP little a. They, it's not that they're not compliant. It's that, that a very major portion of lipoprotein A is actually reported out in the assay for LDL. There are some formulae people have developed for actually uh, uh, adjusting LDL for I LP little a, but it isn't easy. And you know, somebody a lot smarter than me, like Peter Jones or Christy Ballantyne, is going to have to figure it out. But but the bottom line is, it's 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 difficult. So how does this particle get patients into trouble? So if you look at the, the structure, so you see that. Um, First of all, the oxidized phospholipids are very pro-inflammatory. And then the, there is a prothrombotic component related to the ApoA portion of this, uh, this particle, uh, which is involved in plasminogen activation, fibrin degradation. It's, it's interfering with the fibrinolytic system. And so it has this very nasty prothrombotic uh, uh, effect. And then the, uh, uh, the atherogenic component, the APOB uh, and uh, uh, component that's very much LDL-like, is obviously doing all the things that that does. And so you have this duality. Probably the reason it's so noxious is you have a single particle that's both pro-atherogenic, pro-thrombotic, and pro-inflammatory. And, and my view is, and again, nobody's got all the answers here, is that probably it's the APOA component, which looks a lot like uh, uh, um, plasminogen. This is, or, uh, this is what is probably involved with uh, the clotting aspect. And then this other particle, which is very LDL-like, is involved with the proatherogenic component. So it's got that duality. Now here is an important insight. Every other lipoprotein that we see has lifestyle is a major component, right? So if you get somebody who's overweight and their triglycerides are high, you get them to lose some weight, their triglycerides go down. You know, LDL, dietary, uh, you know, driven to some extent. HDL, if you exercise, your HDL goes up. Lipoprotein little a is a pure genetic marker. To my knowledge, there is nothing in lifestyle that alters lipoprotein little a. Uh, it is fundamentally a genetic problem. And this has now been studied well by many people. And so these are some SNPs. There's a whole bunch of SNPs. Look at the couple, couple of them at the top, and you can see their frequencies here. So this one, this RS1045872, is present in about 7%. And look at the odds ratio for coronary disease if you have that SNP. It's a 70% increased risk of coronary disease. And that's purely genetically determined. You cannot alter it, uh, at least not yet. Um, there are two alleles, of course, for all of us. And it turns out that both alleles determine your level. And so this allele on the left is one with uh, a low number of Kringle 4 repeats. 
And so it's contributing, let's say, 60 milligrams per deciliter to the level. This allele has 34 Kringle 4 repeats, and it's contributing only about 10 milligrams per deciliter. The level that you measure is therefore the combination of the, the second allele and the first allele, and you get, now, now, guess what happens if you have two variant alleles? The people that you see that are 400 or 300, in fact, they have two variant alleles. And so if you have a variant, you have a, you know, variant allele, both, both of them, then you have these extraordinary levels. And I want you to see what happens if you have these two variant alleles. This is the odds ratio for coronary artery disease. Can anybody here tell me a risk factor that's worse? It's 4.0. It's a four-fold increased risk. And so knowing about it and counseling those patients and dealing with them is, an, it's why we have to begin drawing levels in these patients, even though we don't yet have a treatment but at least we can do some things. And I'm gonna show you some things that we can do for these patients. So what's the relationship between lipoprotein A level and adverse cardiovascular outcomes? Well, uh, the uh, Copenhagen City Heart Study is as good as any, there are many of them. And what you can see is, if you're in the top 5%, that's 117 milligrams per deciliter, this is your odds ratio, you can see that uh, if you're below five, no big deal. There's a little bit of risk, although it's not statistically significant, in five to 29. Here in this study, at 30, 30 to 76, you're already at about 60% uh, increased risk, and it just goes on up from there. This is very typical of what the studies show. It does not seem like stroke is quite as strongly affected. And it also looks like there is a logarithmic uh, relationship here, not a linear one. Keep in mind that as everybody in lipid world will tell you, for LDL, it looks pretty linear. I mean, we've done these mo this modeling with our IVA studies, but you know, every 10 milligrams per deciliter increase in LDL gives you about the same increase in risk. Here, you see this apparently, what looks like maybe a logarithmic relationship. And then stroke is clearly not as much affected. This is an MI and cardiovascular death marker. And there is no relationship to non-cardiovascular outcomes. It's just, you know, flat, to use my friend John Castelline's uh, comment, it's as flat as a Dutch pancake. Uh, you also will t I also can tell you, doesn't matter if you're male, female, young, old, have a high BMI, low HDL, LDL. I mean, this risk factor is, is pretty much the same, regardless of the rest of your phenotype. It's just added on to your intrinsic risk from all of the other things, like being a man, that increase, that increase risk. Now, what about race? This is uh, obviously, and it's important to know about this. Um, as I mentioned, uh, African Americans have higher levels. What's a little bit uh, uh, interesting here is that their levels are higher for any given level of Kringle repeats. And so clearly there's a lot of risk. And if you uh, look here then uh, on clinical outcomes for CVD, CHD, and even stroke in this particular model, uh, there is a disproportionate hazard ratio for African Americans. And so uh, this is another thing to think about, particularly when you see African American patients with premature coronary disease, they may have a very high lipoprotein little a, and we think it's because the gene originated in Africa and then migrated out to other populations over the, the many uh, millennia. Uh, relatively recently, just January 22nd of this year, always try to keep a talk current, uh, the inner heart folks, uh, Salim Youssef et al. published this. And what you see is there also appears to be in South Asians and Southeast Asians, this uh, disproportional risk for myocardial infarction. 
uh, this will need to be replicated. It's the first time I've really seen very good evidence for this, but it looks to me like, and this is a pretty big study, so this inner heart's big. And so it, it, it may well be that, uh, that there is some disproportionate risk in, uh, in, in, in South Asian and Southeast Asian populations. Now, I mentioned that plasminogen and APOA have this homology, and now this shows you the structure, and the big difference here is all these Kringle 4 repeats that you don't see in plasminogen, so that's just how APOA differs from plasminogen. And I mentioned that uh, this is a prothrombotic uh, aspect of the, of the particle. Well, if that's the case, then what about pure thrombotic complications? And sure enough, there's now a fair amount of data, uh, it's accumulated over the years, to suggest, this is, a, this is a meta-analysis, so you see a lot of studies, that venous thrombosis risk also goes up. So you want to think about lipoprotein little a if people have unexplained DVT, PE, other, uh, other aspects that you would not ordinarily think about, you want to think about here because remember that this is a particle that's both atherogenic and thrombotic. And you see that here clearly in this, in this meta-analysis. Now there's a big surprising finding uh, here, and that is if you look at quintiles of LPA concentration, okay, what you see is people with low levels have an increased risk of diabetes, and people with high levels do not. There is an inverse relationship between lipoprotein little a and risk of diabetes, and I think this is pretty well established through a number of studies. What's interesting is why, and we don't, we don't quite understand this yet, but it actually turns out that it's not the LPA, little con LPA concentration that's responsible, it's actually the number of Kringle repeats. And so, uh, so it's really related to the Kringles here, not necessarily to the LPA level. It's just a little interesting sidelight here. Now, I know we have a very big and uh, very well-published imaging group here. And so, and you guys study aortic stenosis. Well, LP little a is a very big deal in the world of aortic stenosis. So this is... Uh, 2014, you know, manuscript in Jack, uh, also been replicated by many groups around the world, and you can see an extraordinary relationship between lipoprotein little a and aortic stenosis. In fact, if you're above the 95th percentile, top 5%, remember that's one out of every 20 people, look at, the, look at the hazard ratio for aortic stenosis. It's almost three. If you're at, you know, uh, 40, just 40 milligrams per deciliter, you have a 50% increased risk of having aortic stenosis. So it's it, just as we know that uh, there appears to be a relationship between LDL and aortic stenosis, although we haven't been able to mitigate that with, with, with clinical trials, LPA is a very strong predictor. And if you look at the genetics, the SNPs, remember that RS1045872 SNP, has a 58% greater risk of developing aortic valve calcification. And you see that uh, you know, in a variety of other ways. And if you look at genetically determined levels, that's at the bottom here. Again, it's a 62% increased risk. So very important consequence of elevated lipoprotein little a is aortic stenosis. Um, here's the SNP uh, that I showed you earlier, and here uh, is a wonderful, uh, you know, analysis that looks at a set of discovery cohorts like Framingham, Mesa, et cetera, and you see there's a two-fold increase in the risk. Look at the p-value, 9 times 10 to the minus 10th, which even in genome-wide association studies is pretty good, and then a replication study shows this. So, this is as good a study as you're going to find that suggests that uh, there is a very strong relationship between having this particular SNP, which is one of the most important ones that leads to high levels and developing aortic stenosis. It's even more dramatic than that 
because it's also now been shown to be have a relationship to the progression. So you see patient in your clinic, and they have a moderate to moderately severe aortic stenosis, and you're going to tell them, you know, when am I going to need a aortic valve replacement? Well, their rate of progression is much higher uh, if they have a high LP little a than somebody who doesn't. And so even though you can't treat it, at least you can counsel patients about the source of their risk and the fact that they probably need more intensive surveillance because they're going to progress more rapidly. Let me show you how, how dramatic this is. It's a pretty good study here. And what you see is the top tertile, just the top tertile, uh, their hazard ratio for survival with, without aortic valve replacement, you can see that their relative risk is twofold. So you are much more likely to progress to aortic valve replacement over a period of the next five years. Uh, than somebody who has a low lipoprotein little a, which is why the uh, imagers and the TAVR folks and everybody else in this room who does something other than what I do uh, needs to know about lipoprotein little a. Now, what about statins? You know, I mean, um, some of us in this room, uh, my friends, uh, you know, Peter, Christy, others, we want to put statins in the water supply, but, you know, uh, the question is, how do, they, how do they affect lipoprotein little a? Well, this is a study of rosuvastatin. And guess what? Statins raise lipoprotein little a. You know, it's, uh, it's been replicated now in multiple studies that there is a non-inconsequential, quite a significant increase in lipoprotein little a when you give statins. In fact, here's a meta-analysis. Uh, you can see here that, you know, Torva, Prava, Rasuva, Simva, azetamibe, on average, about 11% increase. It's not enormous, but it goes in the wrong direction. And uh, so uh, it's a little bit uh, of, a, of a paradox and a little bit of a surprise. And in fact, being on a statin does not seem to mitigate the risk of lipoprotein little a. We wish that it did. Uh, but you can see that this is on statin and, 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 and baseline, and the odds ratio uh, in statin-treated patients for any level of lipoprotein little a is not diminished. So statins don't mitigate the risk. And in fact, there is some evidence that the hazard ratio in people for LP little a is actually a bit greater in placebo-controlled statin trials for those people that are on the statin arm rather than the placebo arm. And again, I think this is a real paradox here, but if you look at this, uh, age-adjusted and sex-adjusted or multivariable adjusted, you can see, and there's an interaction p-value here, that suggests that the hazard ratio for a high LP little a is actually a bit greater. Now, it doesn't mean you're not gonna treat the people <laughs> with a statin, please don't get me wrong. But don't expect it to reduce risk because, in fact, that risk is independent. What about uh, LP little a levels and outcome in clinical trials? So we did a trial, uh, unfortunately it failed, uh, uh, of evacetropib, uh, which is a CTP inhibitor. It raised HDL 120% and didn't do anything for anybody. Uh, but we went back and we pulled, we had, we had bloods, and so we measured LP little a. And here's what we saw, okay, is that there was in, these, in this trial, you know, very dramatic difference in those people whose LP little a's were, uh, were greater than 100 versus less than 100 in adverse outcome of cardiovascular death, MI, stroke, or revascularization. Very clearly exists in these clinical trials. Now, we, I've had the privilege of seeing a lot of data, thanks to my colleague, Dr. Leslie Cho, who uh, some of you may know. She heads prevention at the Cleveland Clinic. She did something more than a decade ago. She said every single patient that comes to the Cleveland Clinic is going to, uh, for the prevention clinic is going to get lipoprotein little a. It's part of their standard panel. It's not expensive. And she measured in everybody, 
She's measured it in more than 10,000 consecutive patients. It's just an amazing database. Uh, as you would expect, the fourth quartile goes from 58 to 496. So to get into the fourth quartile, she got 3,000 patients in that fourth quartile. So it's just one institution. It tells you, these 11,644 patients in this, and it grows every day. I mean, it's a huge, huge database. Here's the Here's the distribution. You see it looks exactly like what you saw in those population studies. You know, it's left shifted, but if you go up to say, uh, you know, 50 or so and go on out, and actually it turns out the, the portion of patients that are above 60 here is greater than it is in these other population studies. And there's a very obvious reason. This is a prevention clinic. It means it's disproportionately filled with people that have problems with coronary heart disease. And so if you go, if you go to your prevention clinic and you start measuring it, it's not going to be 20% of the population. It's going to be 25 or 30% of the population that you see in your prevention population are going to have elevated levels, which is why it's important to understand all about this. So Leslie then has followed these patients for all-cause mortality. And this is about as striking a finding as you're going to ask for. Using that cut point of the fourth quartile of 58, so that's 25% of the people coming to our prevention clinic, this is the odds ratio for all-cause mortality over 48 months, four years. 28% increase in all-cause mortality. When you sit across the table from somebody who has a level of 100, you know, they probably have about a one-third increased risk of not being alive uh, compared with somebody who doesn't four years from now. So why is this an important risk factor? The, these data tell us everything about why it's an important risk factor. It's obviously worse in the secondary prevention population shown here than it is in primary prevention, but it doesn't matter whether you're primary or secondary prevention, all-cause mortality is affected uh, here, much worse if you've already had a coronary event, not surprising, obviously, to anybody here. Now, how are we going to treat this? I mean, that's a really big, big issue. So lifestyle changes don't do anything. Statins to lower LDL are reasonable. Even though they, they elevate LP little a, they take at least the LDL risk off the table. There is a report that estrogen replacement lowers LP little a by 37%. I'm not sure I'm buying it entirely, but it needs to be replicated. Uh, we conventionally have used niacin. And uh, niacin in large doses will lower LP little a by 30 to 40%. But the effectiveness in reducing events is completely unknown. And I'll be very interested to hear from the other lipidologists here whether you actually are giving these patients niacin. I stopped doing it after the niacin trials, you know, kind of flamed out. Um, I have one patient. I have a kind of a famous patient uh, with an LP little a of uh, over 400 that got a big reduction with niacin, and I kept him on it. PCSK9 inhibitors actually do lower L. LP little a by about 25%. And apheresis can lower events significantly, but it's obviously very cumbersome. The Women's Health Initiative reported, remember this is a thrombotic as well as an atherogenic particle. So what happens when you give aspirin? And so there's a sub-study of the Women's Health Initiative uh, that showed that these people with elevated little a had a hazard ratio of two two plus, and they reported a hazard ratio, a big reduction uh, with, uh, with a positive interaction when they gave aspirin. So in other words, there was at least one good report to suggest that aspirin is effective here. And so one of the few groups of people where I give aspirin for primary prevention are people with high LP little a. I think it's a reasonable intervention to do. Now what about apheresis? Now, what I'm going to show you is not the best data in the world, and I'll be the first to tell you this, because it's using historical controls, as I'll show you. But this is coming out of, uh, do a lot of this in Germany, 120 patients with established CAD received apheresis for five years. 
they were lowered from 112 to 30. That's a 73% reduction. And then they were followed for major adverse cardiovascular events. Now, so the, this is what happened. These are their event rates uh, for MACE, uh, you know, before and after. So this is MACE on the left, uh, before and after this five-year period of apheresis. And they reported an 86% reduction in events. Now, you know that's not good data. It's not a randomized controlled trial. It's, it's pre, post, and the same thing for MI, but it's pretty intriguing that they got apheresis. And apheresis does a whole bunch of other things other than just lowering lipoprotein little a, but it's intriguing. There's a second study. Uh, again, it's an observational multicenter study, 170 patients starting uh, uh, out with LDLs of around 100 uh, and high LP little a, and LP little a of 105. 66 reduction in both LDL and lipoprotein little a. And here's what happens to MI, PCI, and cabbage. So they had a very substantial reduction in events. This needs to be replicated in some kind of a randomized controlled experiment, but it's intriguing. Now, most important mes message is, how are we gonna deal with this? Here we have a problem that's huge. 1.4 billion people around the world with levels above 50. So how are we gonna deal with this? Can it be pharmacologically addressed? Well, uh, I, I, I mentioned these other interventions. I'm gonna skip over this and talk to you about where it's going. And what's great, because this is entirely a genetically driven marker, what you have to do is silence the gene. You have to put the gene to sleep or the gene product to sleep. And there are three ways to do it, the first two of which are moving very fast. One is an antisense oligonucleotide, which is a DNA strand that is used to, to, uh, to silence, I'll show you more about this in a minute, to uh, prevent translation of the messenger RNA to the protein. The other is so-called short interfering RNA, which is an RNA-based approach. Uh, either, either one has been shown to work. I'm gonna talk for a moment about ASO, antisense oligonucleotide. Here's how it works. You have the LPA gene, you have an antisense, a DNA-like single-stranded uh, DNA that then combines with messenger RNA. It's then degraded by RNAase, so it degrades the complex and you don't produce ApoA. If you don't make ApoA, you can't make lipoprotein little a. You essentially are blocking the production of the ApoA moiety that is, that is that key component. And it basically works in the liver where this is all happening. So the antisense oligonucleotide gets into the liver and then blocks the formation of ApoA and therefore it blocks the synthesis of lipoprotein little a. In 2015, the first phase one trial of an antisense, this is developed by a pharmaceutical company that used to be known by the name of Isis Pharmaceuticals. They changed their name to Ionis Pharmaceuticals. I don't know why, but anyway. So Ionis uh, did this, and notice the doses. So these are 300 milligram doses, okay? And at 300 milligram doses, the, they're, they're, they're treated in this period. And I want you to see a couple of things. One is, this is the percent reduction. 80% reduction of lipoprotein little a. That means that if you're at, uh, at 200, you're gonna get down to a pretty reasonable level, even if you're at 200. If you're 100, you're gonna get down to 20. Um, and then look what happens when you, when you stop giving the drug. Look at the persistence. Day 60, day 80, so long, Persistence. You give the drug by injection, but then it knocks out production of, of uh, ApoA for a long period of time, and it's dose dependent. Here's the problem. You got to give a lot of this, hundreds of milligrams of it, and there are, are safety issues with these th therapies that tend to be dose dependent. Uh, this is just a phase two trial, uh, same idea, 
This one, uh, you know, just two different cohorts. This is moving along. This is now a year later, uh, also published in The Lancet uh, with evidence that it works compared with placebo. And then a breakthrough that's changing. And you're going to hear more about this for not just this target, but many targets. And it's called Galnac. Galnac is N-acetylgalactosamine, uh, or Galnac. And it's a ligand for a hepatic receptor that is an active transport into the liver. If you combine this galactose derivative with the antisense, it, it, it basically allows the liver to actively take up the antisense oligonucleotide. And it increases the, the, uh, the delivery to the liver by 30-fold. And so you can lower the dose by at least tenfold. This is a huge, huge breakthrough. And there are a whole bunch of therapies you're going to hear more about that involve cardiovascular space that use Galnac enhanced uh, gene silencing, including, by the way, short interfering RNAs, which are also moving forward. Here's uh, here, what you can see is, so here you see what happens to the, uh, to the, the you see the, this huge shift in the dose for any given mean reduction in LP little a, this, this is a log scale. So you see this, you know, at least one log and, and between one and two log uh, improvement in the delivery of the antisense oligonucleotide to the liver. And so what happens when you do this? This is now the Ionis antisense oligonucleotide. And here, look at the dose here. It's not 300 milligrams, it's 40 milligrams. And look at the knockdown. The knockdown here, this is against the period of administration, is 90% with just 40 milligrams of drug. Uh, and, uh, and it stays down for a considerable period of time with some gradual rebound. At the AHA in 2018, the final phase two trial prior to this entering the definitive phase three trial was conducted. And you can see different doses. This is 20 milligrams given once a week, 80% knockdown, or 60 milligrams given every four weeks. Um, you know, again, there'll be some decisions that will have to be made about how to, what dose do you go forward with? You know, uh, will patients, is it palatable to have a patient self-inject this small amount? It's very well tolerated, you know, subcutaneously once a week, or do you want to try to give a bigger dose and spread it out more? Uh, I don't want to get into the details about this, but the bottom line is that um, it worked, and Galnac made it work a whole lot better than it worked when it was just the native uh, uh, DNA-like antisense uh, therapy. Uh, we do have some data in the meantime, and I don't know what to do with this, uh, from Fourier with Evolocumab, the PCSK9 inhibitor, that if you were in the fourth quartile for li lipoprotein little a, uh, there was a 36 milligram, I'm sorry, nanomole per liter reduction. And it turns out it's about a 20, it turns out about a 25 percent reduction. I'm going to give you my own uh, editorial view here. It's not enough to make much of a difference, in my opinion. If you're at 150 and you drop to 125 or 120, if you look at the look at the slopes of those risk curves, that's not going to make much of a difference. It's pretty hard to believe that a 20 or 25 percent reduction, unlike LDL, is going to make a big difference. So to me, I don't think it's easy to justify this, and I'd be interested to hear what others, others think. What is intriguing, however, was that in the uh, Fourier trial, if you had an LP little a above the median, you had a much lower hazard ratio with a PCSK9 inhibitor. Pretty intriguing. So the people that got a disproportionate benefit uh, on MACE uh, in, from the PCSK9 inhibitor were those with a high LP little a. So it's the other side of the coin. Maybe, maybe this is worth it. Maybe it's not. It's not a cheap drug. Uh, everybody's got to make their own minds up. 
question is, how much lowering are we going to need to make a big difference? Because we're obviously going to have to model this for the clinical trial. Brian Ferentz, if you don't know his work, is a brilliant geneticist. Uh, now he's over in, uh, uh, is it Cambridge or Oxford? They're all the same, you know, all those Brits, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, basically, if you look at a geometric mean and you looked at the genetically predicted uh, uh, effect and then you look at the odds ratio, you can sort of see uh, that what the relationship looks like between the genetically predicted lipoprotein. So he's a guy, this guy does really great, uh, um, you know, genetic uh, uh, Mendelian randomization studies. And he has published this in JAMA Cardiology in 2018 that if you want to say, okay, you need a 40 milligram or 30, this is a one millimole or 38 milligram per deciliter reduction in, uh, in LDL to reduce, you know, risk by a substantial amount, turns out about 22%. What do you need for LP little a? And based upon his genetic modeling from Mendelian randomization studies, he thinks you need about 100 milligrams per deciliter. And I'll give you some math here. If you take everybody in the top 20%, above 60, you'll get a mean level of something over 100 or a median above 100. If you get a median of 110 or 120 and you can knock down by 90%, you can get 100 milligrams per deciliter. And so he predicts that we could get a 22% reduction in morbidity and mortality in a reasonable clinical trial with a 90% knockdown if we, if we enroll people who are above 60 in that kind of ballpark. Let me I give you, show you my last slide. Knowing what you know, why do I want everybody here to be more aware of this and maybe start measuring it a lot more often? Because there's a therapy coming. There is almost no doubt that these therapies being developed are going to work. They're safe, we know from late, late phase two. There's also a short interfering RNA that may even be a little more effective and lasts for like three, four months. Um, if you don't know about these people, you can't treat them. So who should you screen? Uh, you know, I think people with premature CVD is a no-brainer. They come in your CCU with an MI at 40, you ought to know. People with FH, and we didn't go talk about the intersection here. Family history of premature uh, cardiovascular disease or LP little a, remember it's genetic marker. Recurrent CVD despite statins. Uh, this is from the European, by the way, uh, EAS consensus panel. Uh, greater than 3% 10-year risk of fatal CVD or greater than 10% 10-year risk of fatal slash non-fatal CHD. That's what the EAS recommended. Uh, you make your own mind up about it. We made the decision a decade ago to measure it in everybody coming into our prevention clinic. I personally think that's smart, uh, at the very least to counsel patients. But with therapy coming, I think you want to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And so if I were to come back in a year and ask that question I ask at first, uh, how many people have ordered in the last 30 days, I'd love to see most of the hands in the room go up. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your fascinating grand rounds, and certainly very, very instructive, very up to date too. Questions from the audience? Christy, I know you have a question. <laughs> Here, can you give them? So I, I have a quick question since I'm a chemist. Is there a working group uh, working on standardizing the assay for LPA? I barely can see you. Where are you? Yeah, yeah I, see, I see her. Yeah. Uh, to my knowledge, there's not, but we probably need to, need to do that. Because, you know, if we're going to do clinical trials, we've got to figure it out. Yeah, for sure. Chris. Yeah, I think that the, from the clinical chemistry, they're going to, it's probably going to move towards nanomoles per liter. Yeah. Because uh, it's more internationally recognized that way. So I, I guess, see, that's the, the issue is that right now, clinically, I'm always a little reluctant when they, you know, because the Jupiter study, actually had decent LPA measurements. And I, I tend to prefer when you have a study that has a well-done trial with a good measurement where they show that people who got the drug had benefit uh, if you had a high LPA. Now, yeah. you, still had, you still had a high risk afterwards. Yeah. But there was benefit. So oh, I, yeah. I think it's important to understand is that 
there is benefit for treating people with statin if you have a high LPA. Yes. And that you, you make the point with niacin, the concern is that you may harm somebody right. with the diabetes and right. other issues with that. So I, I think where, where, you, where we're left with is what's the role of PCSK9s? And we need to see the Odyssey outcomes data in a little bit better to understand format. Price going down, it might be something that's reasonable for some of these people, particularly for LDL, it's also up a little bit uh, yeah. with it. The reveal, <coughs> not reveal, I mean, uh, the uh, Accelerate trial, I think the, the uh, curves were switched, right? I mean, the group with high LPA at higher events? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, yeah. it's just the yeah. colors were I, I may have just got the colors okay. wrong. You know, I'm colorblind. <laughs> <laughs> like, a, like a one out of 11 males, you know, so. Other questions? Yeah, yeah Steve, yeah. superb lecture as, as we all expected. Uh, a real nuts and bolts question. If measuring LP little a is that important, uh, which you made a very good case that it is, and I'm just wondering what am I going to do in clinic this afternoon? Yeah. Uh, what's it going to take to just simply add that determination to the standard lipid profile that we reflexly order that's a single click on Epic, make everybody's life easier? You just get it back with the LDL. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't know the right answer here. I'd be very interested in other people. It's a, Obviously, it's a matter of opinion. Um, you know, I will tell you that in my clinic, I'm not, you know, I don't actually see patients in the prevention clinic. I have my own sort of separate clinic. Is I do it when I think it makes sense to do it, but I don't do it in every single patient. You know, if, you know, if I have a, a, you know, a patient that has tons of risk factors, they're hypertensive, high LDL, and, you know, there's not a big genetic, there's not a history of a lot of disease in the family, but I have moved more toward getting it and you get these surprises. You know, you see somebody, you think you understand what their risk factors are, you grab an LP little a and it's 200. And you say, oh my goodness, you know, and uh, then when I tell those patients, I put, I put all those patients, I now have a database in my own, you know, my computer of all my personal patients. It's hundreds now that have high levels because when the phase three clinical trial starts, I'm gonna call them up and offer them the opportunity to participate. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm coming at this uh, from an endocrinology point of view. Yes. And uh, I was interested in the uh, inverse relationship between the serum concentrations and type 2 diabetes. It's not concentrations. It's actually Kringle repeats. So, oh, so it turns out that it's actually, the, 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 you, could, you don't see the effect. It's actually, how, it's actually how many Kringle repeats you have. Now, I don't understand it, but that's what the data shows. Yeah. Okay. It, yeah. Has there been any correlation with SNPs? to see if there's gene mutations uh, at a yeah. lower rate. And yeah, it's not been well studied. And I think it's, it, you know, what, what has happened is the world has been dominated by nihilism here. People have said, well, you can't treat this, so why should we measure it? And so, you know, there's been a, a, a chill on doing the things. All the stuff we learned about LDL, you know, we learned once we developed, you know, before we had statins, people weren't as eager to measure LDL. <laughs> And now that we have statins, they everybody gets measured. So well, the, the genetics are, uh, are even more complicated because it used to say it was all the Kringle repeats, but there's actually, that's, you know, you showed two SNPs in there. Yeah. The SNP that had the highest hazards ratio does not really go with the Kringle repeats. And yes. so that's why it keeps getting left out of all the papers because yeah. Borg's group doesn't want to have to deal with that. I mean, it turns out there are, you can, there are genetic variants where you can have uh, uh, very high levels without having low numbers of Kringle repeats. That's correct. Uh, so it, it's a very complicated story with it. And uh, there's a, the other thing that comes up is there's an inverse association with triglycerides, which might be part of the diabetes story. Yeah, too. could be. Could be. Uh, I have two related questions. Um, since, uh, since you have shown that the ELISA interacts with the LDL, yeah. So the patients who we suspect, like younger patients who have gotten an MI, but have responded already to statins, does that mean when they when the LDL lowers that it is all, but the LPA level you you have shown that it's going up with statin, does it make any difference? When, if should we measure LPA when they have already responded to statins? You, you know. The only point I was trying to make there is that, and I'll bet you anything that uh, Peter and Christy, who see a lot of these patients, have seen this, right, where you give somebody a statin, 
and they don't respond. And then you say, oh, wait a minute. You know, you ask the patient, and they say, swear, I take my statin every day. And I have, I have an, F, an FH, you know, a heterozygous FH patient that, that turns out just didn't respond well to statins. And sure enough, I, I was not smart enough initially to get an LP little a. I got the LP little a, and what happened was they, they did respond to the statin. It's just that the LP little a didn't respond. And so understanding that the assay is giving you a readout that's contaminated by the fact that the LP little a is in that. Now, I don't know if you have a way of making the correction. I've not been able to figure out a way to make the correction, although there's somebody we both know who's working on this that uh, is looking like it's going to work out. So you're going to come up, come up with a way to correct. One more in there. Go ahead. I guess my question is an add-on to that. Is there any relationship when you measure uh, uh, LDL, what percentage of that is little a and what percentage of that is LDL? Yeah. Or is it a moving target? Well, it's, or, or it's don't it turns we know? out to be pretty complicated, um, and that's why it's re been resistant. But there is there are folks working on approaches that would let you actually figure that out. So you would essentially, what you'd get is an adjusted LDL that's adjusted for the effect of LP little a. But but right now there's no no con unless you know one, Christy. There's no commonly accepted approach. I would just want uh, in the concern Quest and LabCorp, which the two most common use labs. Uh, LabCorp gets the animals. <laughs> Quest gets the milligrams of desperator. But even worse are the some of the you know the advanced lipid testing labs in each year, Spectra Cell and True Health. I don't believe their values. I mean, I've seen some very discrepant values. With it. So they don't tell us what their methods are sometimes. Yeah. I'd be very concerned about two points. I think we need to uh, remeasure a lot of times when we see some of these very high values. Yeah. Uh, and LabCorp's use of that to their assay with Marco as agrees with hers. To That's why I showed you the slide showing the different ELISA methods. Uh, in one of them, there was a 50% difference in, in values to based upon which antibody you use for ELISA. So you can imagine, it's all, let me tell you why this is driving me crazy. You know, we, we're going to have to plan a clinical trial. Well, how are we going to screen people for entry into a clinical trial if we, all, if we can't figure out how to measure it? And so it's a really big problem that our lab friends need to help us with. Well, we need certainly some standardization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I know people may not have heard uh, uh, Dr. Ballantyne, meaning the labs that are available are giving two different units, and so we're going to need some standardization. But still, it's, if we can do this, or we can, or we can measure it and know what our local labs are doing, and then right. deal with it. And that's what we've, we've done. Well, with that, Steve, thank you very much for coming. We really enjoyed it. Beautiful. I'm so glad. I'm, I'm so glad you. Thank you for coming over. I mean, <laughs> you know, you probably know you could give this talk better than I could. But. Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center and the Houston chapter of the Business and Professional Women's Foundation are partnering to host this exciting conference designed to inform women about the gender specific Heart disease is the major cause of death in women yet too often heart disease is not recognized in women until late Hello, I'm John Cook with the Houston Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. I'd like to invite you to 
to the second annual Heart of a Woman Conference at the Houston Methodist Research Institute. Houston Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center and the Houston chapter of the Business and Professional Women's Foundation are partnering to host this exciting conference designed to inform women about the gender-specific symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment of heart disease and how women can proactively improve their own heart health. I hope you'll join us for the Heart of a Woman and I look forward to seeing you in February. Please explore our website for more details. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alan Lumsden. I'm the Chairman of the Department of Cardiovascular Surgery here at Houston Methodist Hospital. And I'm Zvonimir Krasier, current President of the International Society of Endovascular Specialists. We are excited to invite you to join us for our first annual ISEVS Symposium. This premier conference will take place at the Houston Methodist Research Institute in the Texas Medical Center. This is a two and a half day conference and it will offer didactic lectures from well-renowned cardiovascular interventionists. It will also feature intensive hands-on workshops designed to teach interventionists a variety of techniques. We plan to offer three tracks, one for the novice or the uh, new young surgeon or young interventionist, an intermediate track and an advanced track. That means you can hone your skills at an individualized level. By the end of the conference, attendees should be ready to apply these techniques and improve their clinical practice. We hope you will join us and we look forward to seeing you in September. Hello, I'm William Zogby, Chair of the Department of Cardiology at Houston Methodist DeBakey and Heart and Vascular Center. I'd like to invite you to join us in Houston, Texas for the ninth annual Multimodality Cardiovascular Imaging for the Clinician. This special event will be held on February 22nd to 24th, 2019 at the Houston Methodist Research Institute in the Texas Medical Center. Cardiovascular imaging plays a vital role in the management of cardiovascular patients. Knowledge of the various imaging modalities is indeed critical in understanding their advantages, limitations, and appropriate utilization. This is in patients with ischemic heart disease, heart failure, cardiomyopathy, valvular heart disease, as well as aortic disease. In addition to didactic lectures by world experts from this country and abroad, this two and a half day symposium offers small group tutorials, each imaging modality, demonstrating heart anatomy to better visualize and understand cardiac and valvular structures, along with other imaging modalities. The course is designed for physicians, mid-levels, nurses, trainees specializing in cardiovascular disease. We also encourage nurses, sonographers, imaging technologists, and echocardiographers, cardiac CT, and MRI specialists to attend. I hope you will join us for this conference and look forward to seeing you in Houston in February. For more details, please visit our website.